Welcome, welcome to our Bible study here at Arbor Christian Fellowship on Wednesday, our regular midweek uh, service. Uh, we have Bible study, and uh, so I'm so glad that you joined us, and uh, just please do me a favor, uh, just, uh, click watching your name if you have a prayer request or a uh, prayer need. Uh, we'll keep sure that uh, we will be praying some of these things and all that. Our study tonight is from the book of Psalms, Psalm 91. Psalm 91, there's 150 Psalms, and uh, we're looking at the 91st. Just a, a couple things about the background of the, the book of Psalms. The Old Testament is divided up into several sections uh, among Bible teachers and so-called scholars. Uh, first, there's um, what is called history. And that involves Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's called the Pentateuch for five books. Penta, you know, Pentagon has got five sides. A pentagram has five sides. Pentateuch is five teaching or five law, the five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Then you've got, and these are called books of the law. Then you've got uh, beginning uh, with Judges, Joshua, and then the historical books, and these also include the Kings, the Chronicles, 1st, 2nd Samuel. And uh, these are our history books. And then uh, next come a series of books. There's five of them known as wisdom books. In the Greek, it's Sophia. Hebrew, Hokema. It means God's teaching, God's truth that we apply to our own life. And then, of course, come the prophetical books, beginning with Isaiah, ending in Malachi, and so the book of Psalms is in what is known as the wisdom books or wisdom literature. And what's amazing, uh, what, what's amazing to me is that if you open up a Bible to the very center, you will open up to the book of Psalms, unless you've got a big, thick Bible dictionary or <laughs> concordance in the back of your Bible, like some of the great study Bibles have. But if you've got just a common, ordinary Bible, I think if you open it up to the very middle, to the very center, you're going to get the Psalms. And there's a reason for that, in my humble opinion, is that the Psalms is the heartbeat, the heartbeat of the believer, right there at the center of everything. It is in the center of the Bible. And the so-called wisdom literature, the so-called wisdom literature, Ecclesiastes, Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, and these uh, books are at the very dead center of the Bible. It's at the heart of all things. It's the central, getting at the very center. So we're going to take a look at Psalms. Now, Proverbs tells us how to get along with one another. It talks about, at first, getting along with our parents, our friends, getting along with business associates and neighbors. But Psalms tells us how to get along with God. And the amazing genius of the Holy Spirit in putting the 66 books of the Bible together put Psalms and Proverbs in the very center of the book. So Proverbs talks about being right with one another. Psalms talks about being right with God. And check this out. Before we're right with one another, we need to be right with God. That's why Psalms is before the Proverbs. So we will take a look, uh, take a gander uh, tonight. I'm just going to go over some of the treetops or the mountain peaks of this uh, mountain range called Psalm 91. Psalm 91. So, if you have your Bible, open it up to very center, and you should be in the book of Psalms. And if you hit the proverb, just flap a few pages over to the right. Psalms 91. First of all, it is one of these Psalms in uh, the book of Psalms, of uh, the 150, that's anonymous. We don't know who the writer is. We know Moses wrote a psalm. We know David wrote a ton of psalms. And the biblical, the, the, the biblical idea is that when a psalm does not attribute the name of a writer to it, the last previous writer's name, who wrote the last previous psalm, whose name was in the psalm as the writer, that's who the writer is. So Psalm 90, it says, it's a prayer of Moses that Moses wrote Psalm 90. So we believe that Psalm 91 was probably written by, by, uh, by Moses. So uh, that's an idea right there. We're going to take a look. I titled this psalm, and this psalm came upon my daily reading 
uh, the psalm now for most of my life, most of my ministry, every day, I've endeavored to read a psalm. So this, uh, you know, this morning I read Psalm 98. Yesterday I read Psalm 97. Tomorrow I'll read Psalm 99. Then the day after, Psalm 100. So a few days ago I read Psalm 91 in my regular reading, and it spoke to me so much. Uh, and I just thought, what is said here, we need to hear at this time. During this time of ultimate confusion, ultimate confusion in our presidential election, ultimate confusion with some of our cities that had recently been burning, ultimate uh, confusion about this virus. Now, I'm not fearful, but I'm careful. Fair enough. Not fearful, but careful. And so during times like these, we need, we need something. And so Psalm 91 addresses that. Our safety, our, our serenity, our security in, in Christ, our security in, in Him. So we're going to take a look at Psalm 91. There's, there's two sets of fours that I want us to hang our hat on or hang our heart on uh, in this study. Four names of God in this psalm, and four blessings from God to us in these psalms. And uh, we study the Bible not for head knowledge, but for heart knowledge, but also for application to live it out. And when I talk about application, application of God's truth or God's word, I'm talking about taking up a general truth and making it our own by our personal faith and walking in its highest wisdom. There are tons and tons and tons of general truths. Application means we take it, we isolate it, we insulate it, and, and then we animate it in our lives. And we take a general truth and we make it our own so that we can, by personal faith, live in the highest wisdom for God. And this is one of those psalms that has... It's very easy to do with this one. So let me read a few of the highlights here. But first, let me give you the four names that God has in this psalm, among many, and the four blessings that we get because of God's promises, because of God's blessing. The four names, and I'm going to individually go into each of these as an applicational truth to take that general truth and to make it our own, apply it into our personal faith and walk. Four names for God. One is Most High. That's the Hebrew El Elyon. Most High. I mean, nothing higher, nothing else. All the others are false gods, phony gods, God only, God up there, God alone. The Most High. It was thought in ancient world that the higher you got, the closer you were to God. That's why they did a lot of their worship on hilltops and mountaintops. That's why in false religion... They did their false sacrifices on the top of a mountain because it is believed that the higher up on a mountain, the closer you were to God up there. We kind of have that view, more or less, don't we? Yeah, you know, that to get closer to God, you go higher up. So he's called the Most High, El Elyon. Second, he's called Almighty in this psalm. Almighty, it's a wonderful, wonderful Hebrew word. If you're a fan of Sandy Patty, she did a song years ago called El Shaddai. El Shaddai, beautiful medley rhythm. Uh, the words rhyme together in half the song. She's quoting the, the Hebrew psalm. El Shaddai uh, means uh, the Almighty. El Shaddai literally means as strong as a mountain. Uh, when you think of the granite mountains, the granite walls of Yosemite, El Capitan, Half Dome, those are pretty almighty rocks. You're not going to bust them up. Or, or you know, uh, There's Most High, El Enyon. There's Almighty, El Shaddai. There's God, God from Genesis 1.1, Elohim. And by the way, any Hebrew word that ends with im, I am, is plural. Now, we believe in one God, but in three persons. And that's why it's plural, Elohim. El is the, one of the Hebrew names of God. El, and then Elohim is his name in Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Please don't write to me and ask me to explain the Trinity. For 2,000 years, some of the brainiest, <laughs> smartest 
great, I mean, Isaac Newton and others uh, have tried to explain uh, the Trinity, and uh, we can't fully explain it. We just know that God is three in one. One person, one God, three characters, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now you say that's impossible. No, it isn't, because I'm two-thirds of a Trinity. I'm a son, but I'm also a father, and I'm no Holy Spirit, of course, but I have the Holy Spirit. So these names, Most High, Almighty, God, Elohim, and then Lord, Adonai. Elohim talks about his power and his remoteness, his what the German theologians in the 20th century called his total utter utterness. His utter, total, utter otherness. Everything that God is, we are not. Everything we are, God is not. But because of Jesus Christ, and what he did on the cross, and when we accept him and he comes into our life through the Holy Spirit, we can be what God is. In fact, that is the striving of the Christian life. To accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, maybe you did it at church, you walked the aisle, maybe at Sunday school or vacation Bible school as a child, or at a Billy Graham crusade, or Greg Laurie crusade, or something, or at church service on an Easter Sunday, or some other time. You came forward and accepted Christ. Well, if you did that, you're promised eternal life, forgiveness of sin, and you're going to heaven. But, but, and this is a very huge, very huge adversative transitive, but, B-U-T, it's just the beginning. The minute you accept Christ, that's not the end. That's the beginning. That's the start. That's the step of growing, glowing, and going in God, of getting more mature, of spiritual growth. We grow in Christ. And much of the writings of Paul in the book of Ephesians, Colossians, and Philippians, and also Galatians talk about our growing in the person of Christ, growing more and more Christ-like. So we see in Psalm 91, and we'll look at these, the four names of God, Most High, Almighty, God, Lord, and then four blessings that He is to us. He is our shelter, our shadow, He is our shield, and He is our salvation. Those four words are used in, in this passage. So, without any further ado, as they say in Great Britain, uh, let me read some of these uh, verses. There are 16 uh, verses. I'm not going to read all of them. We're just going to tiptoe, not tiptoe through the tulips, but we're going to tiptoe through the treetops of the promises. Um, Psalm 91 is much like a Christmas tree. Uh, it has a, a, you know, it has a whole ornament of promises. You put on your Christmas tree all of these ornaments. This, uh, this psalm is a Christmas tree, stringed and wrapped around with ornaments of great promises. So let's begin. Follow along with me, uh, if you're at home, on your kitchen table, your Bible, in your bedroom, on your couch, wherever you, you may be, maybe on your lounge chair, in your backyard with the light on, because I know it's dark here in California time, and if you're watching in other parts of the U.S., it's, it's already dark there. So, Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter, or actually in the Hebrew, it is the secret place of the Most High. This alludes to intimate fellowship, knowing Him and being close to Him, the, the secret place, being in His presence, intimacy with God, which produces integrity before people. Intimacy with God produces integrity. Now, what does the word integrity mean? Uh, I didn't do that, that good in high school uh, in math. I don't know how I survived college algebra and upper division required math courses, but we do know that uh, that integrity is also a mathematical term. Integer. Integer. Like a whole number. To have integrity is to be whole. It's not to be five or six different people. One person on Sunday at church, one person Monday at work, one person Friday with the family, one person uh, down the neighborhood, uh, or and another person there at the service club or business club or or that it's always being that one person that's of that's whole and the same in Christ being what you are wherever you are whenever you are 
uh, it talks about dwelling in the shadow. He is our shelter of the Most High, and we will also abide in the shadow of the Almighty. So we, we see that God is our shelter, our shadow, our shield, and our salvation. Now let me tell you something about in the end of verse uh, 1, we will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Uh, one of my songs that I remember from being a kid is the song, I'm Being Followed by a Moon Shadow. And that real catchy thing, you know, I'm being followed by a moon shadow. And I think it was some Brit guy that, that sang it. A couple of things that I studied and know about shadows. First of all, a shadow implies nearness. Think of it. You only see the shadow of what is near. Whenever you're walking and you see your shadow, it is it is near. You don't see the shadow of something a mile away. The shadow may be there, but you don't see it. So first thing, we are in the shadow. We are in the shadow of El Shaddai, in the shadow of the Almighty. It means God is near and dear. That's number one. I want you to understand the nearness Second thing I, I want you to understand about a shadow is that it is impossible to have a shadow without what? You Probably. guessed it, light. Yeah. Without light. Jesus said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Paul wrote that we shall walk not in darkness but in light. So when we are in the shadow of the Almighty, we see the nearness and dearness Clearness, the clarity and charity of God. He is near and dear, and we see the light, the shine, the radiance of the Redeemer in our redemption. He radiates. I call it the shine. Have you ever had a black eye some way, somehow? And uh, my boyhood, I, I had a couple, and uh, they call them shiners. They call them shiners. Well, we are to be God's shiners. No, not in a fist fight and getting a black eye. I'm talking about the radiance and the love and light of the Lord shining out, glowing out His radiance. Uh, the shadow. The shadow. Verse 2. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress in my God is whom I trust. He delivers me from the trapper. That's the snare. Uh, have you ever set like a gopher trap in your backyard? I remember growing up in San Jose, California, our backyard, he tried, one of the things that he prided himself with is having a nice lawn. Uh, and uh, and he'd be upset when he saw gopher holes, and there would be gopher holes. Well, he'd set up these intricate traps to trap a, a gopher, and every once in a while we'd go look, and sure enough, we, 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 we caught and trapped a, a, a gopher. Here, the psalmist warns about the traps, uh, the, the traps of, of this world. It says here that he is our trust. Verse 3, he delivers us from the snare of the trapper. Uh, you know, sometimes whether we realize it or not, we may be headed for a trap set up by the devil, set up by those who ridicule Christ, set up by our own ignorance, and we, we fall into it. But the Bible promises safety, Security, and in the severity, serenity. Jesus says, peace I leave you, my peace I leave you, John 14, 27. Not as the world giveth, but as I give you. Verse 3, he is the one that delivers you from the snare or the trapper, from the deadly pestilence. Verse, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Deadly pestilence, is anything going on in our nation? <laughs> in the world. Uh, there's something out there. My stand on COVID-19 and coronavirus is I'm going to be careful, but not fearful. Fear not. Fear fear not. Be wise. But he, he delivers. It says that he will cover us with his pinions under his wings. Literally his feathers like an eagle covers the little eaglets, the, the mother eagle. God protects us. We see his shelter, his shadow, the shield, and then we see his salvation. All this in this great chapter. By the way, the devil hated this chapter. You know why? Because it was verses out of this chapter that the devil 
misquoted scripture to tempt Jesus in Matthew 4, Luke 4. Look it up tonight or tomorrow morning in your daily devotion. Matthew 4 and Luke 4. And if you have a Bible that has a side reference to cross verses or things, it'll cross a verse you to Psalm 91. And uh, that promise about uh, he will guide you under his wings and things like that. There's an amazing coherence and symbiotic relationship of the Old and New Testament because it was written by the same person. God breathed by God, the Holy Spirit, preserved, preserved by God. And we have today what is in the original scripture, of course, translated into our own language, but we see the trustworthiness of the Bible. There was no tampering, no, no changing, and uh, that was one of the criticisms that people ridiculed with, with the Bible. They kept saying there's been so many changes, so many translations, so many miswritings. That got all shot down with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947. They were able to match portions of Scripture that was believed and proven by graphic testing and uh, carbon testing of the manuscript. Uh, it wasn't actually paper. It was Some of it was papyrus, which was from a reed, from a bush. Others were animal skins that they wrote on, preserving a <coughs> lot of it. And when they carbon data tested it, it went back to two, 3,000 years. What that says that nobody rewrote the Bible or put in bogus words. What we have now and what we read in our Bible, even in our English language, because it's translated or transliterated accurately, is what God intended us to know. We see the inspiration of the Word of God and the preservation of the Word of God. We can surely, truly trust it. That's why He is our shelter. That's why we live in His shadow, in His presence, and in His light. So we see the shelter and the shadow. Uh, verse 4, it says, He will cover you with His feathers or pinions. Under His wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield. His faithfulness is a shield. The ancient army of David and the ancient Roman armies, the ancient Greek armies, they fought with a sword in one hand and a shield in the other. And most of the times, the, she, the, the shields were like three feet wide and six to five feet high. So they could protect themselves when the onslaught of the fiery darts and arrows came, they would hide behind Then when the enemy ran out, they get out from behind the shields and attack. We have a protection in the Lord Jesus Christ. We see as we continue that he continues to protect us. So there, there's some aspects I want us to, to look at. First of all, the names. Of course, the Most High, Almighty, the Lord, Adonai. That's our relational aspect with God. God, or Elohim, is his power, his eternity, his, his power. It's his character and who he is. Lord, Lord is how he relates to us. That's why in many parts of the book of Genesis, he's called Lord God. In other words, the God of our relationship. God in relationship with us and us in relationship. Uh, one of the best ways that we know God is by knowing his name. It's difficult to understand some of the metaphysical aspects of, of God. And, you know, you get questions about philosophy and about God and what is God like and who is God. Well, he's revealed this to us in the Bible, and the greatest revelation of all is in Jesus Christ. You want to see what God is like? You look to Jesus Christ. You look to his character. You look to God's love. We can understand God by his essences and characteristics, but we will not totally, fully understand God. If, if we could, he wouldn't be that big of a God, wouldn't he? He wouldn't be that great of a God. So we see Most High, Almighty, Lord, and God. The things that he does for us is he is our shelter, our shadow, our safety, and our security. Our, our, our security, the shadow. 
and, uh, and a shelter. We see in this passage of scripture as we as we move on, verse 9, you have made the Lord my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. And here once again, there's a repeat. One of the ways of interpreting scripture, it, it, it's called exegesis, is to make interest when words or thoughts or phrases repeat themselves within a single chapter, especially if it's a short chapter like Psalm 91, just 16 verses. When it repeats itself, uh, that's for exclamation. Uh, by the way, in the Hebrew language, in the Hebrew vocabulary, there were no exclamation points as we have in English. You know, the exclamation point, this, and then a dot at the bottom. Uh, the way they use exclamation point is by repeating words, word order. But repetition was their exclamation point. And so here once again we see the words most high, most high. Verse 9, for you have made the Lord my refuge, even the most high, the dwelling place. Going back to verse uh, 1, you know, the, the, the dwelling place. He is our dwelling place. He, he, we dwell in his shelter. So we have a place. We have a place. And we have a person. And so we see that it is a shelter of protection. It protects us. We're, we're under shelter. Uh, one, of the great, one of the great hymns of, uh, of, of the Christian faith is the song Rock of Ages by Augustus Toplin. Rock of Ages, and uh, he was caught once in a massive, massive rainstorm. I mean, it was like raining cats and dogs. Might have even seemed like literally it was raining cats and dogs. And he sought shelter, and he found a huge granite rock overhang out in the wilderness and the hills, and he hid himself under it and managed to stay at least somewhat dry until the rainstorm, uh, you know, left. And as he was under that outjutting piece of granite from a little hillside that kept him covered, he came up with an idea for a song, uh, the song Rock of Ages. But what's the next words? Cleft for me. <laughs> Rock of Ages left for me. And Jesus Christ is our rock. Rock of ages, a cleft of shelter and protection. Notice Psalm 91. The Lord is my shelter. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I like that word abide. That's uh, called stick to -itiveness. Stays near. Stays with. It isn't a fleety coming and going but it is a definite stance, a definite staying with the Lord. We dwell in the shelter. We abide. We abide. We abide in Him. That's why in the upper room discourse, John 14, 15, and 16, technically it's verses 15, chapters 15 and 16, but most people put in chapter 14. But in chapter 14, they were walking towards the upper room and then they got in the upper room. And so it's called the upper room discourse. And Jesus talks about abiding in him. John 15, 5. He who abides in me and I in him shall have much fruit. Much fruitfulness. What, what is Christian fruit? Well, oftentimes we think of it of another Christian. Uh, here, here's the thing to understand in biblical fruitfulness. Only an apple seed and only an apple can reproduce another apple. Only an almond seed and only an almond can reproduce another almond. Only a watermelon or a watermelon seed could reproduce another watermelon. An orange can't produce a watermelon, as far as the technical rules are, you know. And so what do Christians reproduce? They reproduce the Christ in them. That's the fruit. That, that, that is the fruit that is the common, basic, foundational core of our fruitfulness in the Lord. Our fruit is other believers. Other believers hanging off the vine of our existence. Other believers. There's also another kind of fruit 
Galatians 5, 22, 23 talks about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. By the way, the word fruit there is singular, not plural. It is one cluster of these nine things. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, temperance. Against such, there is no law. Galatians 5, 22, 23. By the way, that fruit, that fruit that is produced by the fruit of the Holy Spirit, by the way, everything that is described as fruit there describes the character and the presence and the personhood and what Jesus Christ does for us. It describes Christ. The fruit is love. God is love. Christ is love. He says, I have loved you. Love, joy. My joy do I give you. Not as the world giveth, but the joy, that love, joy, peace. My peace I leave with you. Love, joy. Peace, uh, all these blessings. So we see in Psalm 91, four names of God, four blessings from God, shelter, shadow, a shield. Now, the shield in verse 4, uh, what do you use a shield for? Uh, his faithfulness is a shield. A shield is used in the battle. A uh, shield is used, uh, you know, in one hand you have the sword, and in another uh and you have the shield. The shield. A shield is for the battle. But the, the next one, the, the fourth blessing, salvation, is of rest. And we juxtapose our spiritual life often with the interchange of rest and battle. Rest and battle. By the way, let me remind you, with all the crazy stuff going on with our politics and with governors and senators and candidates and politicians... Never forget this, whether you hate politicians, whether you hate this, or whether you hang on their every word, or somewhere in between, or the only time you give attention is during the voting season, just remember this, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our fight is not against a governor, a senator, a president, a candidate, against Obama, or Bush, or Trump, or uh, our, our enemy is not flesh and blood. Our enemy is principalities, powers, and dominions of the devil. His kingdom, his structures, his dominions. By the way, the name dominion, I'm not even going to go there, okay? It's kind of been in the news uh, about the voting counting uh, machines that uh, allegedly some say were rigged to change votes from one candidate to another uh, candidate. I, I don't have the wherewithal or the insider knowledge on that, let me stick with what I'm pretty sure of, and that's truth from the book of Psalms, verse 91. Uh, I've read this passage at least 200 times, studied it. I keep a journal, I keep notes, I look at it in Hebrew, Aramaic, here and there, and, uh, and whatnot. And, you know, it's truths and blessings never exhaust. You could read it 200 times, and the 201st time, God shows you something new t to the heart. Something, how many times have you read scripture and the Bible, maybe Matthew, Luke, or especially John's gospel, and you've read it a ton of times, and you read it, you say, I never saw that before. Wow, what a hit. You know, it might happen to you in Sunday school or in your personal quiet time, or as you read the scripture, or read the, the gospels and things. So I challenge you uh, just to take a book of the Bible and, and read it through. Uh, it's easy to do some of the letters of Paul and Peter because they're short, three, four, six chapters and things and so make it make it a plan have a systematic study and plan so let me let me tie this all together first of all we apply his name and his dwelling place and his safety we have shelter we have a place we have protection we have a spiritual roof over our head so to speak when it's pouring cats and dogs as it was for augustus Toplady when he wrote rock of ages cliff or cleft for me we apply his name by the way verse 14 it, it, here's a great blessing and promise to go away with uh tonight there's tons of these like i said it's like a christmas tree wrapped around with ornaments tinsel and ornaments and lights verse 14 uh it says because he has loved me therefore i will deliver him I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He knows my name. We know his name and what it means. 
one of the great ways of knowing God and understanding God is knowing what the name represents. And it's amazing that the names of God capture his strength, his character, his being, his essence, often what he's doing or what he's done. We know his name, but better is he knows my name. He knows who I am. He knows where I am. He knows what I need, and he is able, he is able to supply that which we need. That's Philippians chapter 4. But look at this verse 14. He has known my name. We have his fellowship. We have his favor. And because of all these, we have his fervor. And that's his fire. The fire of him. He knows my name. He knows my need. And whatever need you have today, maybe it's just peace and all the discombobulation and confusion and now we're going through a second round of lockdowns, close the churches, do this, you can't do that, forget Thanksgiving, you can't eat a turkey, you can't, I mean, it's almost like it. Well, first of all, we follow the Lord our God. We answer to Him. Yes, when the laws are reasonable, the Scripture says to go along with them, but they are not, uh, we, uh, we make a decision and let the Lord lead and guide us. Yes, this Sunday will be live streaming. This Sunday we will be live streaming. And even though they're talking about closing stuff down and, and everything, I'm not going to send anybody out that shows up. I, I, I can't do that as a pastor. I can't do that as a shepherd and to throw out a sheep. So you just let God lead you. You let the Lord lead you, but I'm going to encourage a lot of you to stay home and see us live. See us live on, on Facebook. This too shall come to pass. And I want to tell you, I would rather err on overcaution and nobody gets anything, nobody gets sick, than to just, oh yeah, you all come, come on, no fear, it's bogus. No, there's a middle ground. And my goal, a year from now, two years from now, if the Lord hasn't returned yet, that we look back at 2020, we look back at 2020 and say during this situation, this pandemic and pandemic and everything else along with it, that we did the right and most prudent thing that we could do with what we knew at that time. That's, that's my goal. I don't want to upset anybody, nor do I want to prove anything to anybody. The only thing I want to prove is the Word of God and that we follow Him. So those of you watching, wondering about Sunday, you know, if you have any questions... Call me and I'll explain it to you again. So let me close and, and, and wrap it up. God actually desires our time with him. He, he really does. He wants us to commune and fellowship. So I want us to just consider uh, some things. As I mentioned, the safety, the security, the severity of this world, but the serenity that we have in Christ. His nearness. We're under His shadow. And a shadow represents nearness. You cannot have a shadow if something is not near. And this is the nearness of God. The nowness and the newness and the nearness of God. The shadow not only represents, as I said earlier, we need to drill this into our minds and hearts during this time, especially during this time when some people have a, a time of fear. And I'm under a little bit of fear, fear of doing the wrong thing. Fear knowing that I answer to the God, but I also answer to my people in loving kindness and as their shepherd, as their protector spiritually. And I'm not going to be stubborn and bullheaded to make a point about anything. Submit and surrender to God and see the prudent thing and let the Lord lead. God desires us to... Spend time with him. Uh, a couple of things that's beautiful about this that I close with. Number one, where it talks about dwelling in the presence of him, in his shelter, in the shadow, under his fortress, uh, we get to look into the inner sanctuary and the mercy seat of God. We have a dwelling place there. We have a place reserved for us. You know, what if you know, you're going to one of these fancy, fancy restaurants? And, uh, you know, it's one of these where you have to adjust your eyes <laughs> to the light inside the restaurant. 
and when you go to the restaurant, you notice a long line out the door, a long line that even extends to the parking lot. Have, have you ever done that or seen that? But you've got a reservation. You walk right up past the front door. You go up to the maitre d' all dressed up in a fancy tuxedo. Give them your name, and he goes, yes, we have your reservation. Follow me right here. Well, that's a little taste and touch of, of heaven. We have a place reserved for us in the upper room. Jesus talked about a place for us reserved. So we, as in this world, we still dwell in God's presence, in a shadow, under his shield, in a shelter. We also have a place reserved for us. And that reservation was paid for not by a check and a bill at the end, like at a restaurant. It was signed in the blood of Jesus Christ. I love you, reserved, and your name for you. A reservation. So we have uh, in the inner sanctuary and in the mercy seat, we have a place. And by the way, we have it now. We're just not there yet. When Christ returns, we'll be there. Or if something happens and our time on this earth, our sojourn, our pilgrimage in this earth is through, and we transfer to that dwelling, to that sanctuary, uh, we have a place reserved. And then the next thing is we cling to a communion of constant confidence. This passage of Scripture is all about safety, security, serenity, safety from the snare of the traps of this world and the trapper. We are held by Him, and in His hand we cling to the common, constant confidence. We, we trust in Him. Uh, he even mentioned in verse 14 how we're protected by some of the angels. Uh, this was the verse that Satan perverted in tempting Jesus there in the wilderness in Matthew 4, uh, Luke 4. He's, he knows my name, uh, a great promise of trust. We trust in him. And much of the Psalms are Psalms of trust. We dwell in the secret place of the Most High God. Therefore, He knows our thoughts, our feelings, our pains, our hurts, our anxiety. He knows our ways. Uh, he knows us. He loves us. He is there for us. So, what I want to challenge you this week, whenever you see a shadow this week, no matter where you are, think of the fact that we are in His shadow, His presence. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for this fantastic, fantastic psalm of fellowship and favor. Speak to, speak to our hearts. Let us apply your name to our hearts. Let us know your safety, your security. And even though we live in times of severity, we have your serenity, the peace that passes all understanding. So let this be real. Lord, let us live. Let us live the rest of this week and through these trying and challenging times. Let us live in the atmosphere of your dwelling place, of the inner sanctuary, of the mercy seat. And let us, as we are in constant stepping in this world, be constant in the communion and confidence in you and in your presence. Lord, bless us with this psalm, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. But God bless you for watching, and just click your name in that you watched. It blesses me and lifts up our, our film crew. I want to thank Vic Viturus who films this, and uh, God bless you. Sunday morning, 1045, we'll see you then.